Notice with me James chapter 4 and verse 2. It says, you do not have because you do not ask God. You do not have because you do not ask God. Many Christians are just passively waiting for God to do something for them. You see, and they say, well, if the Lord wants me to have it, he'll give it to me. If the Lord wants to do it, he just will. Well, we know that God wants all sinners to be saved, but it doesn't happen simply because it's God's will. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What about those who don't call? Well, they won't be saved. And to call on the name of the Lord means to ask in prayer. Amen? That's true, right? So yes, God knows all things. He knows what you need. But as I have said repeatedly, he requires our cooperation. So God knows how to be God. That's not the problem. We need to know how to be believers. We need to know how to work in his system. Amen. And so we must present our petitions to him in prayer. But I want you to notice more especially the very next verse, verse 3. That's James chapter 4 and verse 3. I'll read also from the New International Version. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So why you ask is just as important as what you ask. Because motive matters to God. Motive matters to God. So this verse says, if you ask with the wrong motives, the wrong intention, then it's not going to be answered. Now James chapter 1 verse 6 instructs us, But let him ask in faith. So we should pray when we are petitioning God to do something for us or to give us something. We should ask in faith. Faith is not believing anything you wish. That's fantasy. That's fallacy. They put people in insane asylums for believing anything they wish. I believe I'm Napoleon. I believe I'm Neil Armstrong. I'm on the moon right now. That is not Bible faith. That is not Christian faith. Faith is accepting the testimony of God is true. Faith is the confident response of my heart to the truth of God's word. So faith begins where the will of God is known. But the will of God is not just what God desires to do for you, but the underlying reason why. So you may know what God wants to do, but if you don't know why he wants to do it, that could be the reason your prayers are not working. So maybe we can imagine a situation where a son says to his father, give me 1,000 rupees. And the father says, why do you need that money? And he says, because I want to buy a packet of cigarettes. And the father says, son, I'm more than willing to give you money, but I'm not going to help you buy tobacco. Amen? So you need to know the why of your prayers. Years ago, I was studying on gifts of the Spirit, manifestations of the Holy Spirit, as they're listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the Bible even says that we should desire these things, earnestly desire gifts of the Spirit. It tells us more than once, you see. And so alone in my bedroom, this was many years ago, alone in my bedroom, I said, well, I said, well Lord, I desire these things. I want these manifestations of the Spirit. That would be things like prophecy, but also word of knowledge, word of wisdom, you know, that type of thing, to be operating in my life, in my ministry. And right away, I heard a still, small voice in my spirit, in my heart. It was unmistakable. I know I didn't imagine it. Just one word said, why? And uh, I didn't have an answer. It kind of floored me. Why? You say you want gifts of the Spirit in your ministry. Why? 
And as I was struggling to give an answer, not, not exactly a voice, but something just seemed to say to me, is it so that you can be more popular? Is it so that you can feel more appreciated? Is it so that you can get a bigger offering? And I said, no, Lord, no, no, that's not the reason. See, God is concerned about the why, not just the what. Say it with me, motive matters. I heard the testimony of a woman, this was several years ago, and she was uh, in a meeting and, she, and the, uh, an evangelist was going to lay hands on her for healing. And before he prayed, he suddenly stopped and said, excuse me, sister, why do you want God to heal you? And without thinking, she said, so I can play tennis. Well, there's nothing wrong with playing tennis, you know, that, that's perfectly fine. But is that why you want to be healed? I don't think that's a really worthy motive. How will your healing affect the kingdom of God? How will your healing advance the cause of Christ? Is it just purely selfish reasons? Some women say, pray that my husband will, be get, will get saved. Okay, why? Why? Because I'm tired of living with this devil. I'm tired of living with this Judas. I'm tired. And we'll see, that sounds like it's just your own personal selfish reasons. Wouldn't a better reason be because I don't want my husband to go to hell. I want him to know the Lord. Isn't that a better reason? Amen. So what he's saying is selfish prayers, particularly carnally selfish prayers, are not answered. Faith works by love, and love is focused Primarily on others, on God first, other second, self last. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, we're talking about motive. That's what I want to talk about tonight. The motive, the reason why. In 1 Kings, we read about a man named Adonijah. Adonijah. He was the older brother of Solomon. And before David, the king, died, Adonijah claimed the throne as his own. But at the urging of Nathan the prophet, David installed Solomon as king instead of Adonijah. Well, when Adonijah heard Solomon is now king, he pleaded for mercy. He ran to the tabernacle of David and the Bible says he laid hold of the horns of the altar because under the law, you know, asylum was granted to those who took hold of the horns of the altar. He's pleading for mercy and Solomon gave him clemency. Now see, why is that a big deal? Because in ancient times, the transition in power was always a, a little rough and it was very common for a king to kill all rivals to the crown. It was not uncommon throughout the world to eliminate your entire family to make, to make sure that your throne was secure. And Adonijah knew that. So later, okay, everything's fine, you know, okay, we're, everything's hunky dory, every, everybody's peaceful. But later, this is my point, this is what I want to think about. Later, the same person, Adonijah, entreated. Bathsheba, who is the mother of Solomon, to petition the king that he may have Abishag. Abishag was a beautiful young woman who was an attendant to David in his old age. And so he wants to have her because David's, David's dead now. Well, when Solomon heard Adonijah's request... Coming from his mother, see, Adonijah knew that he would listen to his mother. When, when Solomon heard that request, he said, why are you asking for that? And um, he had Adonijah put to death. Wanting to marry David's attendant, really you could say, I'm sorry, but really you could say his concubine, although he didn't have relations with her. Really wanting to marry David's, you know, girlfriend, whatever you want to say, that, that in itself was not a sin. That, that's okay. But you see, there's more to the story than that. 
Because again, in ancient times, and particularly in Eastern culture, the widows of the late king became the wives of his successor. And to marry or to seek to marry such a widow was equivalent to putting forward a claim to the throne. He wasn't just saying that because she's pretty and, you know, he'd like to have a nice wife. No, 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 that had nothing to do with it. He knew by taking her, that is evidence of the fact that he has replaced David and not Solomon, his brother. See, again, uh, just, just for your own information, after the incident with Bathsheba, God said to David in 2 Samuel 12, 8, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. Well, I mean, you know, what does David need with Saul's wives? Again, that was the custom that he took over the whole house. So when, when Adonijah wanted this girl, that's really what he's talking about. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. So Adonijah's motives were wrong, and it didn't go well with him. Motive is the real reason why you're doing something. As opposed to the supposed reason. In other words, motive is what's going on beneath the surface. Not what everybody thinks, but what you know to be the, the real truth. Now, uh, we can't see each other's hearts. And of course, you and I both know that Christians are really good at faking this. They can say all the beautiful words, and I'm nobody's judge, and neither are you, but God sees our hearts. So maybe everybody else is saying, I don't know, it seems like really great, you know, reasons and everything, but God tests our hearts. Did you know that? Hallelujah. So that means we would do well to check our motives continually, especially in service to the Lord. Why? Because if wrong motives hinder your prayers, it stands to reason that wrong motives would hinder other things that you do in the kingdom. Amen. So wrong motive would limit the effectiveness of our preaching, our teaching. Amen. Philippians chapter 1 verse 15 says this. Philippians 1:15 says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from good will. So that means Paul is referring to motive for ministry, motive for service. That would, that would include not just preaching, but ushering, uh, working in the sound booth, working with children on the praise and worship team, I don't know, whatever, greeter, counselor, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, soul winner, evangelism. Motive is important. So it's interesting that even in Paul's day, some people had the wrong motive. See, we have a tendency to think that, you know, we got all these problems, but back in the first century AD, everybody was perfect and there were no problems and they all had halos. No, that's not true at all. They had the same issues that we face today. So some people in Paul's day preached the gospel out of a competitive spirit. They were jealous of Paul's success and they wanted to best him or do better than him. We know that for many people, their favorite sandwich is peanut butter and jealous. And they eat it every day. Amen. Amen. So rivalry, a competitive nature, which is very naga and also very wrong, very ungodly, very wrong, very unscriptural. And that may be the reason why some people are not blessed like they should be blessed. He did it. We'll do it too. No, friend, what did God call you to do? You run your race, not somebody else's race. Come on, stop being, you know, an imitator of everybody else. And not only in the ministry, but in every part of life. They had a school, we'll have a school. They have this, we'll have that. He did it, we'll do it. Wrong, wrong. You may do those things, but there won't be any anointing on it. There won't be any grace on it. You just do what God called you to do. 
If you walk with the Lord, many times you will walk alone, just you and him. Don't expect a big crowd to follow you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, there were others who preached with good intentions. It says out of good will. In the Greek, it says literally good thought. So that means they were thinking the right thing in their hearts. So once again, you have to guard your heart. Always check yourself. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Amen. Notice verse 16 and 17. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. By the way, in the New King James Version, those verses are reversed, but the more reliable manuscripts have them this way. That's why it's different. So he said, there are some who preach the the gospel out of love. The New Living Translation says this. This is so interesting to me, and I never noticed this until today. This translation says, they preach because they love me. So that means, listen carefully, these believers that Paul is referring to, they were inspired to share the good news not only because of their love of Christ, but also because they love Paul. I'll say that again, give you time to think about it. These believers preached the good news. They were inspired. They were motivated, not only because they love Christ, and that's obviously first and foremost, but also because they love Paul. You hear me in virtually every message refer to Brother Hagin. It's, it's, it's almost like a running like joke that, oh, here he goes. I knew, I knew it was going to come. Some, some of you will always mention that to me. Why? I don't blindly follow anybody. I don't, I, I don't follow a man. I'm, I'm endeavoring to follow the Lord. But I do have a deep sense of gratitude and loyalty in my heart to Brother Hagin. Now, that may not be the way you feel, but you're not me, okay? And I'm indebted to him, indebted to him, and I want to represent him well, even though he's gone home to heaven, because he trained me and ordained me. And there are others in my life, in my journey, and I'm sure there are others in your life too, that have mentored me, who have done more than maybe just, you know, shared a good word, but they have, they have taken time to be with me. They have, you know, spent, uh, shared their heart with me. And, and I, I have great love and respect for them as well. I think of my pastor as one, and then uh, I would have to include Brother Mark Hankins as a, one that I really uh, admire and who's helped me a lot in my life. And th- there are others as well. And so what I'm saying is the respect and the honor that I have for them has something to do with why I preach to you today. And that's what those believers that Paul referred to, that's what they were saying. That's how they felt. Some people in ministry have no loyalty and no gratitude at all. They have been blessed because of the labors of others, and they fail to see that or to even acknowledge it. There's nothing spiritual about ingratitude. I said there's nothing spiritual about ingratitude. You should praise God, and you should show some loyalty and some, and some gratitude to people that God has used to help you and bless you. The voice translation says this, same verse of verse 16, I think it is. They wish me the best because they know I'm here in prison in defense of the gospel. What, he really, what, what he's suggesting by that is these people who are preaching Christ, I'm in jail, Paul says, and they're preaching the gospel. They're sharing the good news with others. They understand there's more at stake than just personalities or petty differences that we might have between people. Because what happened to Paul affected all of Christendom. 
It affected generations to come. They recognize that. This is bigger than just somebody that you know. This is bigger than just, you know, somebody that you're familiar with. This, this is the, the work of God in our lives. And we need, to, we need to do all we can to not hinder that. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. But there were others, Paul says, who were motivated by selfish ambition. Their primary uh, driving force was a desire for simply personal gain. Paul talks about people who think godliness is a way to make money. And he says godliness with contentment is great gain. But he notice he uses the word contentment. In other words, there are people, we meet them all the time, and they have dollar signs in their pupils. It's all about me. What can I get? And that is anathema. That's wrong. The Message Bible says this. I think this is verse 17. The others, now that I'm out of the picture, are merely greedy, hoping to get something out of it for themselves. Their motives are bad. They see me as their competition. And so the worse it gets for me, the better they think for them. Well, that's the wrong attitude. I said, that's the wrong attitude. When others in ministry are doing well and they're advancing and that irritates you, that's not, that's not right. Is envy a sin? Because of envy... The Jews handed Jesus over to Pilate. Even Pilate knew that. Because of envy, the Jewish leaders persecuted Paul because people were listening to him and not to them. Envy is a terrible sin, dreadful sin, okay? It's not okay. Amen? And if you cannot rejoice when others are blessed, that will hinder God from blessing you. If you cannot rejoice when God uses your brother, your sister, that will hinder God from using you. Somebody sings really well and everybody's applauding. Woo! Then it's your turn to sing and we just hear crickets dripping. And, like, and you're, now you're angry at that person. That's not the right attitude. You have to be, guard your heart. What is your motive? To be applauded or to serve the Lord? You know, if you, maybe you did something, you know, uh, some kind of a project in the church, and they mentioned, you know, this person and that person. We appreciate them, we appreciate them, and we appreciate them, and they forgot to mention your name. Does that bother you? No, doesn't bother me, but I'm not coming back to this church. <laughs> See, that's the problem. Maybe, maybe the Lord intentionally did something so that person wouldn't call your name because he knows you've got a problem. Maybe you're going to have to die to some things before God can actually promote you into some things. You have to get to that place where you don't care whether you're appreciated. You don't care if you're applauded. You don't care. Listen, if you serve the Lord and you especially like teaching and preaching, but in other things too. Sometimes God will ask you to share a message and you know the people there don't want to hear it. So what are you going to do? I know, I know people in ministry who only give people chocolate and candy and sweets because they know the kids will like it. And they'll come back for more chocolate. So you're well-liked, but all the kids have diabetes and no teeth. <laughs> if you really love people, and if you really love the Lord, you'll speak the truth in love, even if they don't like it. I'd rather have people say, I don't, I don't like some of the things he said, than to have them say, he always bathed me in sweet, pretty lies. Amen. Hallelujah. So there were people, these people thought that Paul would be frustrated. That now converts that he had led to the Lord are no longer following him. His influence is diminished because now he's incarcerated. You can't minister to people personally. And now they're free to just, you know, kind of stand in the limelight in his place. 
They mistakenly thought Paul was just like them, that he was only in this for his own benefit. They're wrong. That's why the Bible says in Titus chapter 1, verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. People with a pure heart assume the best of others. Their motives are right, and their natural inclination is to assume everybody else's motive is right. So, sometimes maybe a little naively, but their heart is right. People whose hearts are defiled assume that everybody is as dishonest and corrupt as they are. So they're very distrustful of everybody because obviously they can't trust themselves. Amen? So that's what these people thought. Notice how Paul responded to this in Philippians 1.18. What then? Meaning like, how do I respond to this? Some people are preaching out of love. Some people insincerely. Well, what about it? Only that in every way, whether in pretense. Pretense means you're pretending. It's fake. Whether in pretense or truth. That means you really are doing this. Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. See, Paul didn't care if people thought highly of Paul. Paul didn't care if everybody glowingly admired Paul. Paul wanted Christ to be exalted. So it, he wasn't frustrated that others are preaching while he's in jail. That's fine with him. He doesn't mind that at all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Motive matters. Say, to, say it with me one more time. Motive matters. Motive matters. All right. Many years ago, um, like in the 1980s, I began listening on the radio to one uh, minister, one, one Bible evangelist, really. And so I would tune into his... Pro and I had only been at that time filled with the Holy Spirit a short time, like... like a year or, or, or maybe less than two years. And, and so I would tune into his program every day, you know, Monday to Friday. And, you know, he, I, I was blessed, you know, and encouraged like that. Some of this man's methods for raising funds were questionable. You know, like, you know, every, and every, every, every week he had some kind of a gimmick. I'll be honest with you. Like, like, you know, today it's holy water. For your biggest offering, we're going to send you, you know, a bottle of that holy water. And if you just pour that holy water on you, you're going to have a miracle. Then the next time, it was like a little, I don't know, a little a Bible verse written on a piece of paper. And you put that Bible verse in your pocket. And you're going to get an, a, a prosperity in your life. because. The, and the next, you know, of course, you have to give a special offering. For that. So he had very questionable means, you know. And... Um, one time, I even attended a meeting that he conducted. Just by, by chance, I happened to walk into the auditorium, and, and he was there, a large crowd. And he was in the middle of, the, of his you know, um, you know, ministry time. He was calling people by name out of the audience, even giving their address and, and what was wrong with them. You know, like, like, I don't just mean one or two people. I mean like, like a lot, just a long list. And so me and my friend were like really amazed, like, wow, man, the word of knowledge is just working in this man nonstop. But later it was discovered that his wife was reading off the mailing list and the, and the prayer requests that were sent in off stage, and he was hearing it through an in-ear monitor that was secretly, you know, concealed so it wasn't the Holy Ghost, it was, it was a trick. And, and, and he got caught, and he was debunked as a fraud. Now, what about it? I don't think that man's motives were pure. I think there's some mixed, mixed motives. Maybe on one level, he, you know, I don't, I'm not his judge. Maybe on one level, he really does love the Lord, but there's some other deals, there's other issues going on. Okay, I think that's clear. And I had given this man, no, I was like 20 years old. I had given this man, set, mailed in several offerings. I mean, like maybe, maybe two or something. But it wasn't a large amount. But for me at the time, it was significant, you know. 
And then all this came out. Hmm. But I prayed to the Lord and I said, maybe, Lord, maybe this man's motives were not pure, but mine were. Maybe he's a cheater, but I'm not. I gave because I honestly wanted the gospel to be preached on the radio. And, I, and by giving, I believe that would have helped him to do that. And God blessed me. Not because of that man, but in spite of that man, because my motives were right. Hallelujah. And of course, I no longer support that man's ministry. <laughs> Why not? Well, not only do you need the right motives, you need to have some wisdom. <laughs> I'm not going to give you know, people money and they can waste it and they're not using it on the things of God. Motive matters. Say it again. Motive matters. Hmm. I heard a story about some men in America in the Great Depression in the 19, from 1929 when the stock market crashed on Wall Street, really until World War II and after, the United States was in a terrible economic decline, uh, uh, high unemployment, you know, a terrible time. And so there was a group of men who uh, wanted to travel to another part of America because they had hopes of getting employment, getting a job. But they didn't have the money to get train tickets. So they decided that they would do open-air preaching. Now, they were not Christians. They were not born-again men. But they had, you know, like some folks that we know of, they had a, a church familiarity. They, maybe they had been to church or something like that. So they kind of knew how to sing some gospel songs, and they kind of knew how to preach something. They didn't want... Uh, they, did, they were not doing this out of love for the Lord or even love for the people. They simply wanted an offering afterward so they could buy the, the train ticket and they could all go and get a job, you see. And the thing that is, one of the men, he preached some kind of a message somehow and he read, I think they had a Bible or something, he read John 3.16. And several people responded to the altar call and got saved. So these men, they went on their way. One of the men who responded in that meeting got born again and later became a pastor. Now, fast forward some 20, 30 years, that pastor attended a conference, a minister's conference in the city of Chicago, big city. And while he was uh, walking along the sidewalk, he bumped into the man who had preached that, 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 that day, you know, so many years before. And so he later came back and testified, brought the man with him and testified before all of the ministers, you know, 20 years ago, this man led me to the Lord, and tonight I led him to the Lord. <laughs> How can that be? How can that be? You see, those men who preached were insincere, but the men who responded were sincere. And God honors his word where it is believed, even if not under ideal circumstances. So maybe, you know, maybe some of you could say, yeah, there was someone who told me about the Lord, but he was drunk while he was sharing the gospel. I could smell the liquor on his breath. But that really touched my heart. I mean, well, God is not endorsing liquor because the guy that shared it with you was drunk at the time. But he does honor his word. And if your motive and heart is right, God will bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, does that mean being insincere, insincere is acceptable to God? No. No, it's not acceptable to God. In fact, Jesus had harsh words for hypocrites. You see, it's very harsh words. And in the same book of Philippians, chapter 2, I read from chapter 1, but in chapter 2, Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So do nothing with the wrong motive. Amen? Now, I want to go a little further. In Philippians chapter 2, 
Paul told these believers that he was planning to send Timothy to them to encourage them, to strengthen them. And he says in verse 20 and 21, Philippians chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So notice again, he's revisiting in chapter 2 the same topic of motive. He's coming back to it. It must have been an issue. It must have been a problem. He's coming back to it. And this, these statements in verse 20 and 21, these are very troubling statements. Very troubling. Think about it. This great man, the Apostle Paul, man who wrote half the New Testament, said, Timothy is the only person in his company or in his ministry team who is sincerely concerned for the welfare of the believers. So that means there were other people who worked alongside Paul and they were not genuinely concerned. That's a, that's a very uh, 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 shocking indictment for Paul to say that, isn't it? But it's, it's true, you see. So motive matters. Be a Timothy. Be a Timothy. Be a person whose primary concern especially in connection with the things of God, especially in connection with ministry and, and, and serving the Lord, whose primary concern is not for yourself, but that other, for, their, for their own others' well-being, for their spiritual development, for their advancement. Be a Timothy. Hallelujah. It's not about me. It's not about how I feel or how well I'm appreciated. It's about serving the Lord and helping people. I have met many people over the years, and I suspect that maybe you have too, who were focused like a laser beam on promoting their own ministries, building their organization, making a name for themselves, advancing their careers, but not really building God's kingdom. I'll never forget many, many years ago, I heard... uh, a man named Jim Zirkel, who was a missionary to Guatemala, and he made this statement, and I'm so glad it, that, that I, got it, I, I heard this. It, it resonated in my spirit even to this day. He said, some men build their ministries, other men build the kingdom. If you will build the kingdom, God will build your ministry. That's so true. That's so true. Amen. Hallelujah. You don't want to spend your whole life laboring over wood, hay, and stubble. Things that just get swept aside anyway because God wasn't even in it. Hallelujah. You want to build for permanence, not appearance. You want lasting fruit, not just quick, immediate notoriety or something like that. Hallelujah. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but let me be very frank with you. Over the years... All the time I meet people who say like, hey, Brother John, can you help me go to America? And I'm thinking to myself, why? And usually they say something like, oh, you know, I want to learn learn the word of God more. You know, they're not thinking very hard, are they? Well, um, God in his mercy sent someone from America to you to help you know the word of God. Maybe. Just throwing that out there, maybe. Hallelujah. Motive matters. I, I remember years ago, someone came, this was, this was like 1990-something, so nobody in this room was there, you know. But someone came to me, yeah, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to go to a Bible school in America. Can you help me? And I thought, you don't even go to church here. Well, you know, I, the Lord will help me, blah, 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 blah. And, and I just said, I, it just makes me a little bit aggravated. And I said, 
If you want to go to America, go to America. Who's stopping you? But don't use the kingdom as an excuse. The world doesn't need any more insincere Christians. Amen. Hallelujah. So we should be people who are genuinely, and I'm sure that I'm speaking to the people who are genuinely concerned about the welfare of others in the body of Christ and in the church. Amen. And I know, I know in the nitty gritty, in the day to day, and in, in, in the it, you can get you can get lost in the details and you can kind of lose sight of that. So you need to maybe step back a minute and say, why? Why am I doing this? And you need to kind of like maybe make a little adjustment, and say, no, I'm I'm not doing this for my fame. I'm not doing this so that I can get anything. It's it's for the Lord so, and to help people. Amen. Serve the Lord, help people. Just keep that in, your, in the forefront of your mind. Amen. And that will, that will bulletproof your ministry. If you're not appreciated or if you're criticized, it doesn't matter. I'm not doing it to be appreciated or, or highly, highly acclaimed by anybody. I'm doing it for the Lord. I'd rather have the smile of heaven than all the applause and accolades of men anyway. So if you, if you have the, the right motive, that will really help you to guard your heart. I don't care about that. I mean, I'm, that's not why I'm here. Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody has to deal with these things. Now, of course, when you're kind of like just not really doing anything, you sit there and say, oh, yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, I know. Of course. But let's put you on the platform under the bright lights and see if that doesn't affect you a little bit. You know, you preach somewhere, maybe, and this could happen. And people come up to you and shake your hand and say, that was the best message I've ever heard. And at first you kind of go, oh, praise the Lord. But after the 10th person says that, you kind of find yourself liking that. And then if the next Sunday, not as many people shake your hand, you kind of sink into a little bit of a depression. <laughs> then you start doing things, hoping that people will respond favorably to you, like, you know, congratulate you and pat you on the back. So being genuinely concerned about the welfare of other people is the cornerstone of ministerial ethics. People need to know something about ministerial ethics, a certain understanding, a code of conduct, how we relate to others in the ministry. Amen? So whatever we do, we need to ask ourselves, how will my actions affect others? Right? How will my decisions, what I do, how will that affect others? You see, friends, it is unethical to try to steal people out of someone else's church and bring them into your church. That's wrong to do that. That's unethical. That betrays a heart with wrong motives. How will this affect the other person? Someone else has labored, presumably, given their time, prayers, effort, and then you just come along and try to woo them to join your group? How, how is that right? How, how is that right? It's not. Now, you might sit there and think, well, Brother John, so many people have left their home church to join this church, but I didn't pull them out. They willingly, voluntarily made that decision. Other than just telling people about the benefits of church in general or why I feel like it's good to be a part of this church, I didn't, I didn't go to their house and say, okay, you need to come. I'll, I'll, make, you, I'll make you an assistant pastor if you come to, come to my church. I'll, I'll make you the treasurer. I'll make you the secretary. You can lead the singing once a month. I didn't do any, we didn't do any, play any of the games like that because that's unethical. That's wrong. And by the way, I've had lots of people who left here to go somewhere else. I mean, you know, you kind of not always happy about that. Some of them you are happy about that, but you're not usually happy about that. No, honestly, sometimes you say, praise the Lord. Okay, that was an answer to prayer. <laughs> but most of the time you're not happy about that. But, you know, that's between that person and, and, the, and, and, and the Lord. Amen. It is unethical 
to draw away employees from another man's ministry. It's wrong. Oh, yeah, we need someone who can do this. Oh, I got some friends in such and such a city uh, that work for such and such a minute. I'll call them and say, hey, uh, brother so-and-so, we need you to work for us. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's unethical. That's wrong. You don't do things like that. Are you listening to me? There are many unscrupulous rogues in the body of Christ. Do not be like them. We have to live by a higher conduct. Amen. Brother Hagen, he pastored, you know, for 12 years. And, 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 and the, the last uh, period of time was during World War II in America, in the world. And, and in America, gasoline, petrol, was rationed by the government because they needed it for the war. Okay, so, you know, they're, they're only giving a limited amount of petrol to each, like, home. So nobody can go anywhere because, you know, there's no, no petrol. If you have a car, there's no petrol. You know, even if you have a car, it's hard to get parts and things like that. So there was a man and his wife who lived uh, close to where Brother Hagen was, close to the church he pastored. But this man was a member of another church on the other side of town. But that church belonged to the same Pentecostal denomination. As Brother Hagin, it wasn't just a church. It was actually part of the same Pentecostal denomination. And so that man and his wife came to Brother Hagin. Said, Brother Hagin, you know, uh, war is on. It's hard to travel, that type of thing. And, uh, but at any rate, uh, we live closer to your church than our home church. So we, we're going to withdraw our membership from that church and join your church. And Brother Hagin said, I won't accept you as a member. I won't accept you as a member. The man said, why not? Because that's not ethical. That other church needs you. And Brother Hagin said, I know for a fact that that man at a, at a, was like the only man in the church who had a good paying job. And so his giving really paid the bills in that church. And if that man leaves, that church is going to go under. He said, I'm not going to accept you in this church. Now, Brother Hagin said... Honestly, if the man belonged to some dead church that doesn't believe in the new birth or believes that speaking in tongues is of the devil, oh, well, if he wants to come, I definitely would welcome him. But this is, he's in a church that believes the Bible. They believe in the blood of Jesus. They preach you know, salvation by grace. They believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, no, I won't accept you. That shows a level of integrity that is rare. That is rare. That's what you and I should have in our dealings with people. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me say this because we have Bible school graduates here and others who may be watching online. Never split a church. Never try to split a church. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians, for you, all of you in Corinth are God's temple. And the spirit of God dwells in you, all of you. The next verse says, if any man destroy the temple of God, God will destroy him. If you want to die early, start splitting churches. I promise you, you're going to get in a lot of trouble with God. And you can resist the devil all you want, but it ain't the devil, it's God. Do not go there. That's wrong. How will my actions affect someone else? Let me just say this to you. I get it. Sometimes you feel like the Lord's leading me out or I need to, it's time for me to move on. Yeah, sure, I got that. When you go, and I'm not, I'm not asking you to go. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> that happens, you know, in general. When you go, you go quietly and you go alone. Whenever you leave a church, I don't care what church it is. If you're watching online, your church. When you leave, if you leave, you go quietly and you go alone. What does that mean? You don't tell everybody, hey, everybody, I'm leaving. God's not using this church anymore. I think the pastor's backslid. I'm going down the street and start my own church. He'll join me. You might want to read the Bible. Whatever man sows, that he shall also reap. It's going to happen to you too if you do that. That's why we see in some places Baptist Church A, Baptist Church B, Baptist Church C, Baptist Church D, and all the letters of the alphabet. That's not right. Amen. So you and your spouse, your children, 
I got it. But you don't take all your friends with you. You don't call them up, I'm leaving. Uh, sorry, I won't be able to see you. Or disguise that as a prayer request. Just pray for us, we're leaving the church. <laughs> you lying dog, you. You think people are stupid? <laughs> Amen. That's wrong. Hallelujah. Do not use people as a stepping stone to further your career. The road to success is not made by climbing over the backs of others. Be careful. These things are important. I've said it before. You can say, oh, Lord, grow my church, grow my ministry. Just remember, the same number you can help is the same number you can hurt. Amen. I'm not holding anybody back. I'm not jealous of anybody's success in ministry. I rejoice with all. Amen. We're all on the same team. We're all part of the body of Christ. But Hebrews 13, 18 says this. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. Have a clear conscience. Huh? And then do things honorable. In other words, there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do things. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We don't have to resort to unethical tactics to grow our ministries. You can trust God. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. He didn't say, I played dirty tricks, Apollos used child psychology on them, and that's how we got it. God gave the increase. One more verse. Romans 12, 17 says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Now listen, this is true also in the business world. This is true in the business world. Do things above board. Do things honorable. You know, before you tell everybody in Dimapur that you're a Christian, live it. Maybe some people need to peel that Jesus bumper sticker off the back of their car first. <laughs> Come on. You're, if you're being dishonest in business, if you're, if, you're, if you're cheating people, if you're dealing underhandedly, please don't share the gospel with anybody. And I beg you, don't tell them you go to this church. <laughs> tell them you go to some other. Make up a name. Tell them I go to the... Mount Saramati Holiness Church. Tell them, make up some name. But <laughs> Since you're so clever with your words, go ahead and do that. But, but don't, don't, don't. That's wrong. Hallelujah. Be honorable. I don't like it. See, when, when people keep changing their story, when there's these inconsistencies, one time they said this, the next time they said something else, that means they're lying. And who trusts liars? Even liars don't trust liars. <laughs> Even a crook wants to do business with an honest man. I worked for many years in a business that was notorious for being underhanded. The automobile business. Oh boy. Especially in America. Here you just book it and you get it. But in America there's all kinds of, especially in the past, all kinds of little deals going on and all kinds of shady things going on. And I was thrown right into the middle of that. In fact, I was led by the Lord to work in that. And I found out that if I'll just be honest, maybe I lose some deals initially, but in the long run it'll benefit me because people will trust me and they're looking for someone they can trust in the business realm. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Years ago, I'm coming down to your level now. Years ago, uh, there was a woman that wanted to buy a car. But another dealership down this boulevard had given her a, a fake price, a super low price. They did that so that she would go everywhere and find out that no one could beat their price. And then when she came back, they were going to raise their price somehow like you know, they're going to trick her. So we knew that. And so she came in and she said, can you sell me the car for this amount? And of course, nobody can. That's ridiculous. You know, it's a fake price. You know, so I said, I told her, no, we can't do that. So my manager the next day says, call that woman and get her back in. I said, they, they already said that unless you can beat this price, you know, they're not coming. He said, just call them. I said, no. Then finally he said, just tell them I said to come in. 
This is where I made a mistake. So I called the one on the phone and said, my manager says to come in. And she says happily, does that mean you can, you can give me the price I want? You can beat the other offer? And I said, my manager said, just come in. So she came in. And she's all happy because she thinks she's going to get it at this price, you know, see? And so they took her, you know, uh, in the back room to sign the contract and everything. And we're supposed to just like be a happy occasion, buying a new car and yay, and here's, your, here's the keys and yay, take a picture. But instead they called my name, oh, John Routon, please come to the office. So I went back there, opened the door, and there is this uh, couple and there's the manager, the same manager. And they said, come inside. So, oh. Then they said, uh, uh, shut the door. Oh. And that man turned to me and said, you lie to me you lied to me just like that and he said it like 20 times <laughs> his eyes were just bloodshot red the veins were popping out of his neck he just said you lied to me and I said no sir you lied to me and I felt like a schmuck I felt like a piece of dog doo-doo I felt just like a slug I felt like just yuck and, and then, they, but he said, but I'll buy the car. And he signed it and the manager just smiled sweetly, you know. And then I had to come back and I had to wrap it all up. And I was so uh, terrible. I felt so terrible. And then the manager, after the customer drives off in the new car, he came into my office and smiled and said, you lied to me. He, you know, he's making fun of it. But he's the guy that set it all up. He's the guy. There's all kinds of things going on in the business world. If you'll be honest, you'll stand out like a sore thumb. If you'll be honest, I'm telling you, that's a great testimony. It really is. So let's be honest. Let's be honest people. Let's do all things honorably. I know sometimes we, we fail in certain areas, but if we do, let's, let's repent. Let's get it right and, 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 and move forward in, in the right way with the right motives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.